Hello everyone, Gary Klein here, uh, along with Stephen Barton, fisheries biologist, and uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us here this morning. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about habitat and how to fish around it, aquatics, and we also have a really cool experiment that we're going to do on Thermocline, which is really, really interesting. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to just take a moment and uh, mention Aaron Martins. Uh, Hopefully that everybody keeps him in his thoughts and prayers. He's undergoing surgery this, uh, this morning. He may already be out. I know it was scheduled for early this morning. So definitely keep Aaron uh, in your prayers um, and his family. Uh, they're just uh, great, great people. And we all hope he pulls through this and I'd like to see him out there on the circuit beat me again. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to mention is Char the passing of Charlie Campbell. Uh, Charlie Campbell was definitely an icon. Uh, to me as a young angler growing up from California, always heard about the talents of Charlie Campbell in his top water walking the zero spook. I actually got to fish with Charlie on several different occasions and what a, what a gentleman, great friend. Uh, he actually uh, spent a lot of time with, around my girls as they were raised on the circuit. But Charlie will be missed by, uh, by many. Um, He'll, he'll never be forgotten. He was just a great, great man, gentleman, a friend of all. And I know he was very uh, instrumental in actually creating competitive angling side by side with Johnny Morse and building this industry to what it is today. So uh, our thoughts and prayers go out to Charlie Campbell and his family also. So now we're going to dive into some of our topics that we're going to talk about here on Facebook Live. Uh, we got a beautiful setting. We're on a little a little lake here out in the middle of uh, nowhere. Yep. <laughs> kind of a special spot. And just before we uh, started Facebook Live, Stephen saw a fish cruising and made a cast with one of the Berkeley El Chapos and caught him. Yep. But what we're going to cover is aquatic vegetation, some more species of aquatic vegetation uh, that are very common. We see them all across the country, from the northern waters all the way down to the tip of Florida. And talk about how aquatic and the fish relate to it in their environment because aquatic changes according to water clarity, depth, right. temperature. Depending I mean it comes and goes. Species. Yeah, and yep. species. So it'd be really interesting to hear a lot about it. Okay. What else go ahead over here? Well, the thermocline, I think, is one of the coolest experiments I've ever seen because thermocline is something that is actually in many parts of the country is just now starting to become a factor moving forward into the summer, into the fall. We're going to cover all that, cover the fall turnover, how the thermocline is, affects the actual environment, and how easy it is to read on your electronics. A thermocline is something that on my Lawrence Electronics, when I'm on a body of water, that I know a thermocline is developed, it's so easy to see the depth that thermocline is in by looking at your electronics. So we'll cover that also. Okay, so we're going to cover uh, a couple of aquatic plants as well as thermocline. We're also going to take questions. So if you guys have any questions at all, uh, please submit them as we're going. And uh, we've got the girls here. They're going to stop us, ask us the questions, make sure you get your questions answered uh, the best we can. Exactly. Let's okay. get started. We're going to start with milfoil. We're going to talk about a couple milfoil species. Uh, first, I'll do a native milfoil. So this is a variable leaf milfoil. And Ken, if you want to just get close to that so everybody can see variable leaf milfoil. All the milfoil species have feather-like leaves. So I'll, I'll show you the leaves in just a little bit. But you can see they come out uh, from the side of the milfoil right here. And they're just feather-like leaves. On variable leaf milfoil, we have four to five leaves growing in a whirl pattern. Now, Gary, what I mean by a whirl pattern is they all grow from the same point. So I've got... Oh, got, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I've got yeah, one cut up right here. Around the stem. So we have four to five leaves growing from one central point, and you see those leaves have little leaflets that make a feather-like leaf. Now this is variable leaf milfoil, a native species. So it's it's native across the United States. We actually have about 20 species of milfoil in the United States right now. Wow. Not all of them are, made, are, are uh, native. Right. So this one's a native species that uh, is found across the United States grows out in 12 to, to 15 feet of water uh, of course in clear water it can grow a lot deeper uh, in, in kind of that more turbid water it'll grow really shallow the the variable leaf milfoil uh, grows from a central root that that has a rhizome 
so it spreads as it goes, but they, they grow in, in small clumps. Um, have you seen variable leaf? Yes, I have. Okay, so a lot yes. of times, whenever it's just in the water, it looks kind of like a pipe cleaner. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see that it's, it's uh, you know, more wide than other millfold species. So I'll show you another one so we can compare. So this one right here is Eurasian milfoil. Eurasian milfoil is probably the most common that you're seeing, but it's a non-native species. This is an exotic species. Really? Yeah, so Eurasian milfoil, you'll see the difference. The leaves uh, still have that feather-like pattern, but there's spacing in the branches now. Oh yeah, you can clearly see the spacing. Right, so there's big spacing in the branches, and like we talked last time with the coontail, with depth, the spacing will increase. So if I saw this, this uh, Eurasian milfoil, floating on the shoreline and I see those spacing, I can really gauge how deep this came out of. Wow. So this was actually really shallow water this came out of. Uh, you see it's got a, a, a nice stand of, of seeds up here, so it does reproduce through seeds. Mm -hmm. It will also reproduce through budding. And what budding means is the tip of the plant that's underwater will actually break off every winter and float around in the lake, as well as it, it reproduces through fragmentation. So we talked about fragmentation last week is whenever one piece of plant breaks off and creates a new plant that roots. So this has multiple reproductive methods. It's an extreme grower. It grows in, in every environment and it's very invasive compared to our native milfoil species and it crowds out our native milfoils. So if you'll hold this one, I want to spin this around and get Canyon to just come up to these leaves to, to show the difference. So the Eurasian milfoil has much shorter leaves with a lot more leaflets to it. The variable leaf has those longer leaf leaflets and there's less of them and they're spaced more uh, further apart, but they both grow in that whorl pattern. Whenever you have the Eurasian milfoil, it's gonna grow in, in big clumps with multiple branches on the stem. So it grows more like what coontail does, but it's rooted to the bottom. Right. Right. So it, it gets extremely dense uh, and, and hard to fish whenever it gets in those big mats. They'll lay over on the top and you'll see these seeds at, at the surface. Whenever you have something like one of our native milfoils, a lot of times they'll grow in much smaller clumps. Of course, in the right environment, any of these can, can become too dense. But whenever you're fishing milfoils, uh, you know, knowing if it's Eurasian versus, versus variable leaf or something native is important to me because I have all these branching stems. So I know that that, that mass is so dense that the fish can't penetrate it very easily. Mm -hmm. They have to be on the edges. Whenever I have something that's a little less dense, I may be able to, to find fish within it. Yeah, they might be in the canopy or in an opening inside of it. Exactly. So, you want to talk about some lures around milfoil? Yeah, no, I will. But let me just say this. Okay. That's really, really a very interesting tip about the distance yep. to the depth. Yeah. So because that's a real quick uh, indicator to give you an idea of just how far out some of this grass may be growing. Right. So, if you weren't here last week, let's, let's just cover that again. Yeah, okay. Okay. All right, so last week what we said is on coontail, hydrilla, and this milfoil, a lot of your submerged plants, they've got these real flaccid stems, right? Mm -hmm. They can't support themselves out of the water, but they kind of tell on each other. So if I see a piece floating at the boat ramp, I can look at not just the length of the stem, because they will lay over on top, right. but the spacing between the leaf's pattern, between each set of whirling leaves. So if that spacing is real narrow like this, that's pretty short for milfoil, then I know this came out of shallow water. If there was a foot between each set of leaves, then I know it's out of deeper water. That and I can start shore. to predict how deep the milfoil is actually growing. Mm -hmm. So if I can't visualize it on the surface, but I see a piece and the leaves are spaced every foot, well now I'm in 10 foot of water looking for milfoil. But if I get a piece like this and I see that those leaves are only spaced by a couple of inches, I'm not going 10 foot deep. It's not growing that deep. It's growing in shallow water. Mm -hmm. So, so the vegetation kind of tells on itself, whenever I go to a new lake, I know where it's at, what depth range to look at, and you can use the Lorance See, electronics that right to there find was, it. That was the point I was going to make, yep. because, you know, uh, as anglers on the water, we're kind of like trackers, and we're all looking for little signs to lead us in the right direction, and a lot of times uh, I often say, you know, I'm looking for my first bite, I want one to rat on the rest of them, you know, I want one fish to kind of lead me in the right direction, well, it's the same thing when you really pay attention to the environment that you're fishing around, when you see a little indicator like that, for example, what Stephen was explaining, I think, wow, this, this milfoil is really coming out of deeper water. Then when I look at my Lorance mapping, I can literally sit in my driver's seat, pull that map out, and I know contours, and I can say, well, maybe that hump over there might have milfoil on it. 
and that hump's got a creek channel on the back side of it let's go look at that so that's just one of the little uh, indicators that kind of leads us in the right direction when we're out on the water fishing now i've got a question from jerry jerry asked how can i catch bass that are guarding fry very difficult for me to figure <laughs> out so we're going to go away from vegetation immediately <laughs> yeah. jerry that's fine how are we going to catch bass around fry well i tell you you know fry garters it, it, it's a little window they're there protecting the fry so basically what you have to do is mimic something that's trying to eat that fry and a lot of the lures that you use just come through the ball of fry and the fry scatter but then come back together and it, you can't get that fish to trigger um, there's a lot of little tricks you can take uh, some of your smaller baits that do the stay right there and it makes it look like you know it, it's eating the fry uh, you can use a little um, uh, you can take a little Berkeley 4 inch general and rig it either wacky style so it stays there or you can rig it Texpos where you can pitch it in and walk it and just make it stay right there. Any of your little perch looking baits, even a hard bait that'll stay right there or top water. What about, uh, I, I, very, like, very good. I like to use a small jerk bait mm -hmm. on, on a spinning reel to where I can get that slow finesse to it. Yep. Well, that's also a great way of, uh, you know, catching, but the other thing that the jerk bait on a spinning reel allows it to stay put. That's right. You know, you're not pulling it through the strike zone of the fish, but no, that's a great question because from here for the next, you know, several weeks or a month, depending on what part of the country you're in, uh, you may be able to catch a few fish doing that. Yeah, I saw some fry garters just this week. <laughs> they're they're pushing fry here in Central Texas, so we, oh yeah, we've yeah. got to get after it. Well, I okay. saw that video that you put up. There was a lot of fry, but no, you know, really fishing around millfold. Uh, a lot has to do with how the millfold is growing in the body of water that I'm fishing, uh, and what I mean by that is if I'm fishing shallow milfoil, chances are the fish are gonna be relating around it. If it's real thick and topped out, um, again, I, I, I wanna know the depth. That's so important to me because if it's real shallow, chances are they're gonna be around it, they're not gonna be in it. If it's deep and it has tall stem growth, then canopies can be created. And if I'm fishing a body of water that has no current, the wind's not blowing, there's no current in it, then chances are your aquatic is going to grow straight up because it's grown to the sunlight. Where if I'm on that same body of water maybe a, a day later and I have a wind blowing that's creating the current, it'll take that canopy and push it over. So the taller the grass is, mm -hmm. the more of effect and the bigger the canopy. Exactly. So that'll give you a big shade pocket, especially in real clear water. Mm -hmm. And if it's grown out of deep water, that means it's clear. And a lot of these canopies may not be topped out. They may be something that you have to pay attention to on your electronics and see that. And when we're fishing like that, we use a heavy jig or a, you know, what we call a punch weight with just a big weight with a big creature bait on it. But let me just add one little tip. And uh, actually, Long time ago, Lonnie Stanley, and everybody in Texas, and, and you know, most people that fish jigs know Lonnie Stanley in his past. Lonnie Stanley was was phenomenal fishing around aquatic vegetation, and back then on Toledo Bay and Rayburn, we had a lot of hydrilla. And all these anglers would go out and fish big weights, big jigs, you know, we were kind of getting into that part of it. And Lonnie Stanley would catch the biggest bags of all the guys out there and a lot of times what he was using was a very light jig and fishing on top of the grass. He didn't want the jig to go down four foot or six foot or eight foot through the canopy. He wanted to fish the top of the canopy. So what Lonnie would do is throw like a 3 16 jig. I mean, that's a big jig. It just was real light. And he'd just fish it on top of the aquatic. Because like we covered yesterday, all of your aquatics, uh, you know, the coontail, the millfold, hydrilla crayfish love to be around aquatics that, that's like their deal uh, some of the best habitat so a jig just is a really good tool to catch fish around some of your aquatic you know the edges or in it but again early in the year when the water temperature is cool the aquatic has not just started to grow right so it's not topped out and that gives an angler the ability to fish around it with other types of baits you know, crankbait, a lipless bait, uh, topwater, spinnerbaits, or chatterbaits, you know, like down on around it. 
but as the water warms and as it grows, it forces an angler to use different set of tools to catch those same fish. Because now the fish may not be relating around it, now they're in it. Because now the grass has got some depth to it, some heights to it. Right. It's got canopies where a month and a half ago, it was only about that tall. Because like you covered last week, this stuff grows at a pretty high rate. Right. Yeah, especially the Eurasian millfoil. And that's why we see a lot of eradication of, of millfoils right now, is because Eurasian millfoil has taken over where our native millfoils grow. Uh, so it's kind of forcing our other plants out, and then we're left with a choice of a really heavy invader. So what you mean by forcing plants out is that once this invades or gets started, it grows so dense yep. that it chokes everything else out. Well, so, so just like we talked about hydrilla, <clears throat> this plant can grow in low sunlight, it can reproduce multiple ways, and it grows very rapidly, mm -hmm. very dense. So it creates a monoculture. So we talked about whenever we only have one plant species in an area, how that's actually a bad thing. We want multiple types of plants in an area to create diversity. That allows us to have you know the most niches for, for the different types of uh, fish, crayfish, things like that. Kind of like creating those edges too Absolutely. that you're looking for. Just, a little bit of this and a little bit of that breaks yep. it up. Yep, so, so whenever we have one species, it, it kind of forces everything out. Uh, now one thing, whenever we talked about milfoil, me and you, uh, you know, before we did this, you said, oh, I always think of milfoil up north. Mm -hmm. So is there a different way that you're gonna fish this for smallmouth and largemouth? Is, is there anything extra you're gonna do there? No, not really. Not really at all. So from north to south, same techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can catch them around the milfoil. If milfoil is the only thing there, the fish are definitely going to relate to it. If it's Eurasian milfoil, you have to understand that this is a heavy invader that's going to start crowding plants out. Exactly. And like I covered last week, anglers use tools to do different things to catch the fish. And that's the reason why, and I showed an example of all of the ducker rods that I have in my rod locker and all the different actions give me, as an angler, lost my microphone, gives me as an angler the ability to make changes with tools and techniques to catch fish in and around the grass. Uh, so yeah, when I fish up north, the water is usually always clear when you're fishing around aquatic vegetation, especially on natural bodies of water. But the point I was trying to make is that a fishing lure can be used as a target bait. What I mean by that is I want to throw to the stump, I want to bang the stump, hit the piling, you know, inside the bush pile. Or I can use a bait is what I refer to as a draw bait. I'm not going to have to hit the stump. I'm going to throw by the stump and the fish that's relating to the stump will come to the lure because of the technique that I'm using. So remember, every time I make a cast with the lure, I'm using it either as a target bait or a pull bait, a draw bait. And that's one of the really cool things that you have access to right now, especially with a lot of downtime, is like My Outdoor TV. Right. All of the episodes of Major League Fishing are at your disposal. But the cool thing, and I, w I have watched, I think, every episode multiple times, because that's a way that I like to study anglers. I like to see how anglers approach, how good anglers have conditioned themselves to be what we call a high percentage angler. And probably one of the things that really sticks out to me more than anything else is that our anglers, when you watch a competitive angler that's in competition on Major League, we don't lose very many fish. No, you don't. Yeah, in our fish handling around the boat, everybody has their own little cork, their own little way. We always land the fish in the same place, me included. The way we hold the rod, you know, we never touch the line and all that. We've got it down pretty darn good. Yeah. So all we do is just make ourselves a high percentage angler. We get 10 bites, chances are we're going to have 10 fish in our hands. Right. And that all comes with just time on the water and practice. And those are the type of things that we study. You know, square shoulders to the bait when I'm retrieving. If you ever watch me fish, my shoulders are always squared on the cast. And if you notice too, I'm right handed. So. I don't ever like to set the hook to a weak side. I always set the hook to a strong side. And the reason for that, I palm the casting reel when I'm retrieving. And if I set to a weak side, leverage on the fish is pulling that reel out of my hands. Where if I set to a strong side, I have the butt of the rod against my forearm into my chest and ain't I've got them. So that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but that's just my way. But that all that only comes from a lot of time on the water and studying it and thinking, you know, outside the box and have an open mind. Because bottom line is fishing. 
you got to tie a lure on the end of the line to make a cast to get a fish to bite it, and it's fun. Anybody can go out and do that. But what happens is that anglers that fish ask themselves this question. How come I didn't catch a big fish today? Or how come I never catch any big fish? Or, man, I didn't catch that many fish. How can I catch more fish? So as soon as you as an angler start asking yourself those questions, then you're going to start studying all of this stuff. And it's overwhelming, but it's pretty cool. And that's one of the reasons why all of the good anglers, yourself included, because you, you fish all the time, we all share one thing. It's a common thread, a passion for fishing. I mean, even if we're not competing, we're still fishing somewhere. Whether it's sunfish or crop you're starting to bite now, or whether it's bass or catfish. I mean, you know me well enough. I love to feel the bite on the end of the line. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. We have a couple of questions. Uh, James, is, James is wanting to know, with flooding and changes in water depth, how does that affect vegetation? Right, so that's a great question. That's a great question, James. So whenever you have vegetation in a lake and, and you flood out, the, the timing of how long it's flooded and how much turbidity is involved uh, could cause your vegetation to die back. So we're seeing that across the United States from last year's flooding. Uh, what we've got is a lot of vegetation has died back and that, that's just because the seedbed was shaded too long. Now, in, in central Texas, where we didn't have much flooding this mm -hmm. year, uh, we have more vegetation than ever because we've had extremely clear water and vegetation uh, is just is growing to the surface already. So it kind of varies whenever you're talking about turbidity with flooding. And so that's a lot of, uh, about the watershed, the age of the fishery, uh, what the shoreline vegetation is like. But if we get that turbidity and then we have longevity uh, with the, that high water level, it will actually knock our, our grasses back. Uh, it doesn't matter what the species is, it's going to knock them back. Yeah, and not only that too, but when that condition occurs at whatever stage that plant is in also adds to that also because right. that plant if it's not deep rooted then a lot of like your Tennessee River lakes when it floods they're running all the locks you've got a tremendous amount of current that's running down all those lakes yep. and I've seen over just the past recent years where like everything has changed like on Guntersville. Gunnersville used to have all kinds of millfold outside. I mean, it was a great outside lake. All that is gone, mm -hmm. and it's all been replaced now with eelgrass. With eelgrass, right. Yeah, which we're about to cover. We'll cover eelgrass a little bit. And, uh, you know, the last part about, you, you know, you said it, it depends on when that, that occurs uh, and the stage of the plant. Definitely, if it's, if it's a plant that has sexual reproduction and, and is creating seeds, and that flooding occurs before that seed production, you lose a year. Just like you would, you know, if, if we lost a year in our fish class, mm -hmm. we lose a year of vegetation seeding, and so that may prevent it coming back uh, in the future. It's a great question. Yeah, good question. Uh, one more question. Derek says, in crystal clear water, how deep can grass or weeds grow? That's, that's a perfect question. So, uh, typically what you do is you take the visibility of, of the water and you multiply that by three. So if I can see down three foot, the vegetation can grow to about nine. Most native species. There are some species like hydrilla, we covered last week, they'll actually grow to 1% sunlight so it can grow much deeper. So if I have extremely clear water, that's 10 to 12 feet uh, of clarity, I can actually grow that vegetation upwards to 20 foot, even 30 foot if we're talking about a species like milfoil. Now some of the vegetation species are limited in how tall they can grow. Right. The stem of the plant can't grow that tall. Milfoil, uh, we can have stems upwards 12 to 15 feet. Same thing with hydrilla, we can have 30 foot stems. Yeah. Whenever we talk about something like, um, I, wanna, I wanna say the eelgrass, well mm -hmm. eelgrass is gonna top out with six, six to eight about feet somewhere match, in there. Yeah. And so that plant, uh, you know, with that clarity, still wouldn't come to the surface, but, but it could grow out in that deep water. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about eelgrass. Yep. Uh, we did, we got our samples. Yeah, we got some eelgrass <laughs> here, some young eelgrass we got. Um, so like you're saying, milfoil in, in a lot of the country has been replaced with eelgrass. And I would say that, that if you don't have eelgrass in your fishery now, this is a species of plant that, that your fisheries biologists are going to be promoting. Uh, because eelgrass, we, we can kind of guess where it's gonna grow and how it's gonna grow. So it's a more controllable plant uh, that provides us the ability to have that type of habitat without any any real uh, you know worry about invasion. Mm -hmm. Eelgrass can get thick and, and cause a few issues, but it's a very easy plant to control um, outside of that. So eelgrass uh, has these long tape-like leaves, 
if you see the ends of them, uh, they have veins on each leaf and they're rounded on the edges. So this is young eelgrass, so it's gonna keep growing. Um, eelgrass reproduces or, or moves through rhizomes. So those are underground roots that spread and sprout new plants. So we have one wow. here, we yeah. have one here, but it always grows in these clumps. So we'll have a central clump of uh -huh. eelgrass, then we'll have a root that comes out and creates a new clump. Then we'll have a new clump, just like Bermuda grass. So right? they're all connected. Yeah, right, exactly. they're all connected, yeah. uh, but we'll have these clumps. So whenever you're <clears throat> whenever you're seeing eelgrass grow, it's gonna make like an under underwater meadow, right? Like it's gonna be this dense patch on the surface, all those leaves are intermingling, mm -hmm. but at the bottom, it's these little clumps. Uh, spaced, spaced uh, fairly, fairly close apart. Now, re the eelgrass will also sexually reproduce through seeds. So there, there's actually monoecious plants. So this plant could be male or female, not okay. necessarily both. So if you have both, then you can have uh, sexual reproduction where we're actually getting seeds to spread across. And uh, the female, if you've ever seen it, it'll have a white flower on top of it. You've mm -hmm. seen it with white mm -hmm. flower. It's got these these little spindly little stems, stems yeah. with a white flower, and then it'll have like a bean, and that bean is filled with those seeds, and then they'll release out in the water, and with current they'll flow. So you see it in a lot of canals. Yeah. That eelgrass will just take off and take a canal. That's wow. because of those seeds. Now we also have dioecious eelgrass. Hmm. Dioecious eelgrass is the same sex in one plant. Okay, so we don't get uh, the that sexual reproduction right. with those. Uh, so you have you have different uh, species. So, you know, if you have monoecious male or female or dioecious and you only have one in the environment, you may not get that seed reproduction. You may only get the rhizomes. Huh, so you have to have the right type. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so whenever you're doing these native plant restorations, you have to have the right type to make it make it do what you want it to do. Yeah. So we can control this plant a lot better. Yeah, and it's, it, it's not a bad plant. It, 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 uh, it's one of those aquatics that I see from northern waters mm -hmm. all the way down in Florida. Yep. I mean, eelgrass is just Basically, about everywhere. Yeah, anything east of the Rocky Mountains. Yeah, uh, yeah, know, that's... California, I haven't seen it out there, but you know, the eelgrass, the way it grows and how it grows, um, especially when it's up in the shallow water, you know, less than four foot, I know, especially down south, bass love to spawn in the eelgrass. Right. Because it's, it's an easy, uh, aquatic where they can waller it out and it seems to always grow like on a gravelly bottom not necessarily a real mucky bottom yeah that's fair and uh they love to spawn in it and it's pretty cool because if you're in a big topped out eelgrass bed you can see the holes right where all the where all the fish are spawning so well for me uh whenever i think of eelgrass i think of shad spawn yeah so when shad are spawning uh they spawn at night and in the first few hours of the day and what they're trying to do is they're trying to stick their stick eggs, their to eggs on the leaves. So they stick it to this vegetation so they can spawn all around the eelgrass and it just holds everything in place. I, I, eelgrass, once again, uh, fisheries biologists are using this plant across the country for native plant restorations, especially after something like the Eurasian millfoil has been eradicated. This is one of the plants going back in, along with, we talked about coontail last time mm -hmm. and your pond weeds, but this is one of, the, one of the plants that's going in. So. If you're an angler that doesn't have eelgrass, you may start to learn a little bit more about how to fish around it and what to do because it may be coming to your, your local fishery. Yeah, we're gonna be exposed to it a little bit more here in the future. And uh, you know, I've had a lot of really good experiences around the eelgrass. Um, the one thing I will say about eelgrass, it's offshore, growing a little bit deeper, like you know some of the stuff that you're faced with now at uh, Gunnersville. It will top probably, I don't know, the true height of eelgrass, say maybe it'll grow about six foot tall. Six to, eight, yeah. six to eight foot tall so it does get tall but the thing about like cranking a plug if you get hung up on the eelgrass it's real hard to rip and yeah. free the grass off your hooks yeah to they break, just break one of these leaves off it's, oh, it's tough just, already yeah. yeah yeah and and the leaf itself uh, if we get real close to it you can see it's kind of transparent right now but you can see that it's got a mid vein and then it's got oh, veins it that go left to right oh, so yeah. it's got a lot of structure to the leaf that's going to prevent you from really pulling a hook through it like you're saying. Yeah, it just wads up on the hook. That's you, exactly you, it's right. It's real hard to clear. Um, so we fish a lot of Texas rig techniques around it or in it. You know, uh, flukes work real good, sinkos work yeah. real good. You know, Texas rig lizards, you know, Texas rig worms and stuff. A swim worm works excellent. That's probably one of my favorite things to do is put a little eighth ounce weight on a Fusion 19 hook and throw a swim worm out and just reel it. 
Yeah. Just reel it, see that. let it swim through the stuff and catch a lot of fish, especially in Florida. That's one of the you know famous techniques. But it, bass love to be around eelgrass. If you watched, uh, you know, Jacob Prosnick, he won our stage uh, two event on Lake Okeechobee, and eelgrass was definitely one of his, well, that was a key thing about the area that he was fishing. Okay. Yeah, all those fish were relating to eelgrass because they were spawning. Right. And he was catching them on a speed worm reeling, so. Well, and, and this doesn't have multiple branching stems, so it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't grow extremely dense. It yeah. will be dense because it has leaves, but it's not so dense that the fish can't move through it. Yeah. So you see a lot of sunfish will, will be grazing all the insects on this plant. Uh, so they're eating the little insects that's bringing those bass in. It just creates a good environment. Shatter spawning around it, yeah. so everything's near it. That's a, it's, it's a good aquatic. Yeah, so eelgrass, Great that's aquatic. one that I would I would learn uh, learn to love. Yeah, and yeah. learn how to fish around it. Right. Because <laughs> it is kind of love-hate when you're fishing. <laughs> yeah, the first time you experience You fire it, a crankbait out there and, ah, oh, that stupid eelgrass. I'm in the eelgrass, in the eelgrass. Because you can jerk all you want and you just can't clear it. Now, if you find it submerged in deep water mm -hmm. and you can run a crankbait over the top of it and not bury down there in it go. oh my gosh it's good yeah, yeah you can tickle the top of a spinner bait of course the yep. blades get caught in it too swim bait works real good around it or any type of a texas rig plastic that you're reeling yep. around it oh, it's, it's it's a good plant perfect um, that's a question lakota yes ronnie wants to know he fished oh ivy last weekend and every tree was covered in pond moss as he said it was extremely hard to fish will this pond moss die off naturally or does it have to be treated okay so i haven't been out to okeechobee lately is he said oh 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 that's even better in our backyard <laughs> oh ivy okay so i'm not far from oh ivy uh so oh ivy is probably filamentous algae is what he's talking about filamentous algae uh, grows on the bottom, but then becomes uh, on the surface in big lime green colored mats. It's going to try to attach to anything it can, rocks, trees in this mm -hmm. in this case. Uh, but that filamentous algae is very temperature intolerant. So whenever we have a mild spring like we have this year in Texas, you know, mainly 70 degree days, cooler nights, uh, it's going to allow that algae to grow. It's one of the first things that grows. Whenever we get into the heart of the summer, it's going to burn off because it's going to get too hot. But the algae is just a symptom of there's nutrient in the water and something needs to grow. And right now, I, I'm guessing OH ivy is a little turbid. You know, we've had some water inflow, uh, so it's trying to clear out. Uh, so that algae, it's going to go through a process and it's going to take several weeks, maybe even a month, uh, until we get that, that summer heat and then it'll start to burn off. But isn't that the same issue that they addressed at Squaw Creek by putting tilapia in? Yeah. So. Uh, in Texas, we're allowed to use tilapia in our private uh, fisheries, mm -hmm. uh, Mozambique tilapia only, and, and tilapia primarily eat algae. But what's cool about tilapia is uh, they're actually mouth brooding fish. So they build nests just like a largemouth bass would. They're very deep nests, yeah. uh, but they drop their eggs, they fertilize those eggs, and then the female will gather them up and carry them in her mouth. So she'll carry them around with her at all times. Whenever the eggs finally hatch, she'll actually carry the fry for several weeks. And so the tilapia, they have just a high survival. So whenever then they go out to graze the algae, the, the female will pull up, open her mouth, and let her little fry out to graze the algae. And they'll eat the algae. She'll gather them back up. If the predator the danger, they all run back yep. in. Yep. <laughs> uh, but you can find find them in, in the mouth. And they reproduce every 30 days here in Texas. Wow. So we get we get a lot of reproduction all summer long. Uh, but they do die off whenever water temperatures drop into the, the high 40s. So they're not, they're not efficient. That's why the lake you're talking about, Squaw Creek. Plant. is a power plant so those tilapia live every year yeah they created a problem now there is no algae the there's no algae left <laughs> and you got five pound tilapia yeah, yeah. oh yeah magnum problem yep. and they want you to take them out but anyhow that's a good question uh yes yeah, so we have one more for y'all continue gerald clayton wants to know in a two acre pond what is considered the correct amount of vegetation he says that he has a lot of coontail that covers about 60 percent of the surface area okay gerald so in, in a private pond and this is what i do every day is yes. is, is private lake management. Two acres is small to allow a lot of coontail to grow. So you want 20% is, is your number. Uh, what I do whenever I'm managing a pond is I let it get to about that 20% and then I'll actually use a contact herbicide to spray back to about 15% and then let it regrow and just fight it back that way. I use a contact herbicide because I can manicure that, that plant. Mm -hmm. So whenever I'm using a contact herbicide, I apply it directly to the leaf of the coontail it kills it off in those very narrow areas. It's only active in the water for about 24 hours, and then the sunlight actually degrades it, so I don't have to worry about creating drift uh, or, or a big issue. So I kill off small amounts of that uh, coontail. I don't use grass carp to control it, because in a two-acre pond, if I use grass carp, they would eradicate all 
follow the coontail. Uh, I would love to, you know, if it's mine and I'm managing it, I may love to eradicate the coontail and then come back with the eelgrass, the American pondweed, stuff that don't grow as invasive. But 60%, uh, you're really limiting the production of your lake. And what I mean by that is you can't grow as many bluegill. Mm -hmm. You can't grow as much phytoplankton, which feed the, the you know, bluegill. the fry and the bluegill. Um, and then your bass just have these small home ranges, so they never can really hunt very well. And they stay in very small areas on the edge of that coontail because all they can do is hunt the edges. Yeah. So our production is low in that lake. Um, if we could reduce it down to 20%, then we'd be good. Yep. <laughs> okay. Good question, good question. Yeah, any more questions, y'all keep them coming. If not, I want to talk about thermocline. Oh, I tell you, this right here is a, a yeah, it's a fully, uh, really cool experiment here with Thermocline. Uh, I'm excited to watch you go through it, and we can kind of talk a little bit about it. So before before I talk about Thermocline, I want to I want to tell our our homeschool <laughs> teachers, our moms and our dads right now that are stuck at home and looking for an activity for the kids, or maybe our teachers that are looking for something to, to send out to the kids, how to make this. Um, so all I did, take a mason jar, and I fill it half with a, a vegetable oil and half with water, mm -hmm. and then I put blue food coloring in. That's Perfect. it. Perfect. It's just that's just gonna make a suspension so that we can see different layers. Yeah. So whenever we talk about thermocline, that's actually the wrong word. Really? We've been doing it wrong this whole time. So uh, it's actually stratification. Okay. So stratification means different layers mm -hmm. because a thermocline isn't just a temperature difference. That's what we associate it with, but it's actually, uh, if, I, if I want to use all the terms, an oxycline, a change in oxygen, right? Which is true. Yeah. So, so there's different variants. So what a thermocline yeah. is, um, it's basically a change in temperature. If I use the word stratification, I'm going to use them interchangeably, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But if I, if I use the word stratification, I'm just encompassing all things that are changing. So I'm using that word Klein as a change. So okay. did you know Klein, you root go. word yeah, means very change. Well, very well. Okay. okay. So, so at the surface, what we have is warm water. And we're going to talk about coming into summer right yeah, now. Yeah, which is where we are right yep. now. So all of the conditions that we're about to cover yep. are just starting to occur. Exactly. Exactly. So. So how the thermocline starts to, to uh, build in a lake, what you have is your sunlight can only penetrate so far. Let's say three foot, just, just for a number. So sunlight can penetrate three foot. Once again, however far that sunlight can penetrate, that water's gonna be warm. At some point, let's say around nine feet, three times that three foot, we'll say around nine feet, that's where sunlight quits penetrating the water. Mm -hmm. So below that, the water becomes cooler, mm -hmm. right? Warm water on top, cool water on the bottom. That's a thermocline. If I just stopped there, okay, we understand what a thermocline is. But warm water on top, cool water on bottom, there's other things associated with it. For example, oxygen. Oxygen will be greater on the surface in that warm water than below. That's because we don't really have a lot of surface to bottom transfer. So we have wave action. So if I just whirl this back and forth, we see uh, that we have a little bit of disturbance in there, but not much. So they're not mixing at all. We just see that that thermocline, that oxycline is moving up and down with wave action. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, it's just being shifted. Right, that's it. But, it, but they're staying separate. Right. So the oxygen that's being produced by the plankton at the top is not reaching the bottom. Mm -hmm. The oxygen that's being added from the wind coming across the top is not going to the bottom. So it's not penetrating past the thermocline. Now, as we progress through the year, what happens is this warm water keeps increasing in temperature, that cold water keeps decreasing in temperature, at some point below the thermocline, we hit a level where there's been no mixing and there's such a temperature difference that the oxygen down here is zero. Okay? Yeah, totally gone. There's totally nothing. gone. There's nothing down there. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've seen that at 10 foot. I've seen it at 30 foot. It depends a lot on clarity uh, and that mixing of the lake. But once we have no oxygen in the bottom, the fish aren't living down there anymore. Mm -hmm. They will come and they will suspend on the thermocline. Now the reason they'll do that is because it's too warm up here in the summer. So they want to come down as low as they possibly can, but still have oxygen. Mm -hmm. So they sit on that line. Mm -hmm. So that's why you catch a lot of fish suspended on the thermocline. Now, as we progress through the year, we get to the summer, it's really dense like this. We have a definitive gradient. But as we progress through the year into the fall, we're going to lose our thermocline. So whenever we lose our thermocline, the lake kind of gets shook up. And if the temperature starts to, to decrease on the surface, it's gonna to continue to get shook up. And then eventually it's gonna be suspended to where we have the same temperature gradient top to bottom. Now, if I'm up north, they have a thermocline in the winter as well. 
So you have really see I was a thermocline in the winter under, right. the, under the ice. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Wow. So you have even if it's not under the ice, you yeah. have ice, then you have cold water, and then you have a warmer gradient in the bottom. Right. It's not going to be as well defined, but it's going to allow those fish to suspend uh, in some warmer water. But isn't it true? You know, maybe this is false, but I've always I was uh, always under the impression that colder water is heavier than warm water. It is. And that's what happens is that, say we're in winter, right? temperature's pretty much within a few degrees from top to bottom. Yeah. Sun penetration, yep. warmer into the, into the summer, right? and now you start getting the thermocline, pretty right. solid. Now you start getting into the fall where you're getting the cooler nights, yep. water temperature's getting uh, cooler on top, and it's sandwiching that warmer water until all of a sudden you get the turnover. Well, so, so it depends on how big your thermocline is. If you have a well-defined thermocline like what we started with, right. you're going to have a turnover, which means just like what you're talking about, this this temperature is cooling and it's sandwiching that, and eventually it's going to flip right. because this water becomes so dense it has to flip. Okay. If you don't have a well-defined thermocline or you have a, a fairly shallow lake, you can actually have that mix slowly. So you don't necessarily have to have that big turnover we think of. Whenever we're talking about Texas, you see sediment in the in the, yeah, you the see surface. everything just floating up. Right, because because it just flips so so quickly. Uh, the thermocline can cause fish kills. Almost every summer fish kill is caused by a thermocline uh -huh. flip. Wow. So what happens then is you have your well-defined thermocline. We're starting to build it again, guys, so we can see it. Uh, but you have your well-defined thermocline, and you have your warm water up top. Now think about, you know, if we have a heavy thunderstorm, a flooding rain, mm -hmm. how quick is that lake going to mix? Mm -hmm. It's going to mix overnight. Yeah. Well, when that happens, we had no oxygen down here. We also, because we have no oxygen, we change our bacteria community, and not to get too far into science, but it produces a lot of ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, things mm -hmm. like that. So our water down here becomes more like a septic tank. Think about it that way. So then if I have that big flooding rain and I have that septic tank, all of a sudden it flips overnight. Yeah. And so are my fish that were living up here now, now that septic tank falls in their head. Oh, their whole, and that's, their whole environment has just changed. That's right. Now they're in survival mode. Well, that's what causes a fish kill yeah. you drop your oxygen so quickly. Yeah. Because yeah, you don't have the oxygen production. Now, the other cool thing about thermocline is because the, the warm temperatures up here, the sunlight's up here, the phytoplankton live up here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a little more science on you. The phytoplankton are going to live on the surface of the lake mm -hmm. during the day. At night, they're going to migrate down and they're going to live at the thermocline. Okay. Now the zooplankton, uh, phytoplankton are the plant type plankton give water the green color. Zooplankton are little animal plankton that eat phytoplankton. They're going to live right underneath the phytoplankton. When the phytoplankton starts to go down, they're going to eat it as it's coming down. And then they're going to follow them down. Right. And then the next day they're going to follow them up. So you have this movement of plankton. Whenever there's sun, the plankton is going to move towards the sun. The zooplankton is going to follow them. Right. Which means our shad and our fish are going to follow the zooplankton. Uh huh means our bass that were on the thermocline early in the morning they're going to come to the surface they're going to follow everything to the surface and then at night they're going to fall back down yeah. so it makes a cycle every single day but everything's going to rely on this thermocline but you're not going to catch fish down here at the bottom yeah, underneath no, no, no. underneath a dense thermocline but the cool thing about a thermocline that if you're in a body of water and it's that time of year and you know you got a defined thermocline that thermocline right there is an angler just helped you eliminated probably two-thirds of the lake because what Stephen was just saying earlier, nothing's going to be below that thermocline worth fishing for. Now, there may be rough fish or whatever, but they have to have oxygen. Your bass population basically is going to be forced to come above the thermocline. So if you go out and read your electronics, that's why when I go to a body of water that I haven't been on for a long time, or maybe I've never been there before, these are my, my Lawrence electronics are my underwater eyes. And it feeds me all this information. I literally will launch my boat and just idle out across the main lake or across the main river arm, and that's the first thing I'm looking for is where, what depth is that thermocline in? Because if it's at 18, I've just eliminated bait pretty much, I'm not going to fish below 18 foot. So now when I'm looking at my offshore contours, I'm focused up. Right. So anyhow, it's just a, a way for me to kind of get dialed in a little bit quicker. Right. Just a little piece of information that helps you understand the environment. Now you can have, let's say, Table Rock, for example. Mm -hmm. You got multiple thermoclines. You don't just have the one. So you know we have our, our normal thermocline, maybe at eight, eighteen or twenty. Uh, but you know you go to the dam of Table Rock, and it's what I, I don't remember how deep it is, but it's pretty we went deep. we went to the fish hatchery there. Yeah, yeah and we it, were way down on the bottom. 
in, in basically the water underneath the original thermocline, there's another one. And that water temperature is probably coming out at, at 45, 50 degrees year round. Um, and that's actually feeding Tiani Como, and that's why they have a trout fishery below Table Rock. Mm -hmm. It's because they're using water from below the thermocline, the second one, mm -hmm. uh, to, to actually give us even colder water. And if you're on a large body of water, that thermocline is not, I mean, you know, it's not the same throughout the entire lakes, what I'm trying to say. The further yep. you get up in the river arms, it all changes. Yep. Yeah, and any wind action, you know, that's going to move it up and down uh, throughout the day. And then if, you, if you've got a small pond, um, we've all felt this whenever we went swimming in a pond, you jump in the pond and your feet are really cold. That's the first indication <laughs> of a, a thermocline, thermocline right there. there. Right, that's yeah. just a change in temperature. But oxygen relates to it, the plankton relate to it. You were saying like you can actually see it on your Lowrance. That's due to the density mm -hmm. of water. Uh, yeah, but you see, I'm not reading the temperature nope. change. Nope. The feedback that I'm getting from my Lowrance is all the plankton that we're talking about. Yeah, whenever there's, there's nothing else below there. To, to give you that feedback. Oh yeah, but it's such an obvious layer. Yep. And again, when that thermocline is really defined, man, it shows so easy yep. on your electronics. So how are we gonna fish it? What are we gonna use? Well, I'm not gonna fish below it. So All I right. just, a lim I used a thermocline and the knowledge of a thermocline and what it does to the environment for the fish to eliminate that water. So again, my thermocline is what I'm gonna pay attention to and I'm gonna fish either on top of it or above it. Right. And again, it would have to do, it would depend on what depth that thermocline's in and if I'm wanting to fish offshore. You know, again, in fishing, all anglers have strengths and weaknesses. And one of my strengths is I love to fish shallow. Uh, so I like to fish targets I can see with my eyes, which normally on a body of water that puts me up the rivers, that puts me in the back end of the creeks because usually that water is a little off colored and there's always a shallow population of fish. So I like to kind of fish up there too, but my second love, strength, is fishing deep. Now I'm not as good as Aaron Martins, but I've spent a lot of time out there and Aaron Martins actually educated me on how to fish a drop shot. And that's another story we'll get into later, but, uh, but I do love watching my electronics and fishing deep, especially with a spinning rod, you know, light line, six pound test Berkeley, 100%. Fluorocarbon is phenomenal, small mouth and large mouth. In fact, last year, you just happened to be in the boat with me, and I caught my personal best on a spinning rod out of 30 foot of water on six pound Berkeley 100% fluorocarbon. You had the opportunity to lip it for me, and yep. it weighed 1397. That was a magnum tank. That's a big one, yeah. Uh, Robert wants to know, do Texas lakes always stratify in the summer, or are there some conditions they don't? Maybe years of excessive rain. All of our Texas lakes are going to stratify. They absolutely will. There's no way for us to prevent it. Uh, you actually need some sort of uh, bubbler or something coming from the bottom to create to create that circulation. Yeah, you have to have that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the reason why. Yep, to prevent that stratification. Yeah, because it's going to be there. Yeah, and 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 it's going to so in Texas, whenever I'm thinking about how many fish I'm growing in a reservoir, I'm actually only growing them from the surface down to six to eight, nine feet, depending on where that thermocline is. If I aerate and I leave my lake without a thermocline all year long, I can grow fish from top to bottom because there will be phytoplankton and things that, that actually get forced down there. There's gonna be oxygen at the bottom, so be an environment where crawfish will be on the bottom below the thermocline. The well, other, you just open that whole lake up now. Right. You're fishing 100% of that lake. Now we talk or about, you have that. We talk about crawfish a lot. Yeah. Crawfish aren't gonna live below the thermocline. Yeah. So they're gonna move to that shoreline where the thermocline meets right. uh, that depth. Yeah. Um, David wants to know, he said he's new to understanding this concept. Is there a way um, to look on the Lawrence unit, like to how to like see how to show it on the uh, thermocline? Well, obviously, I... We don't have a thermocline today. Yeah, we to don't have you. a right. thermocline. So, so what we'll do, David... Water, we can. No, what we'll do, future. David, is we'll get Gary on his social media page. We'll get you to make a video uh, whenever we have a thermocline later this summer. So look in that July July range. Exactly. We'll have a new video. We'll make sure that it says something about thermocline in the Lorenz unit to show you how and to I'll do it. And I'll show you the settings on it and how, yep. to, how to do that. Uh, Wayne would like to know, can you fish a Carolina rig in grass? Oh, yes. <laughs> Folks... I mean, that's a great question because just a few minutes ago, I made the comment, strengths and weaknesses. One of my weaknesses as an angler um, is fishing a Carolina rig. And a Carolina rig 
um, is probably one of the most effective ways, effective tools for catching bass. Believe me, it really, really is. Because probably one of the most effective ways of catching bass, especially on the small lakes, is to fish a plastic worm with no weight on it. I mean, just a weightless worm. For some reason, that's just such a natural presentation. But a lot of us as anglers, we don't have the patience. We want to move, so we have to add weight. Texas rig is the way most people fish them. If you fish a Carolina rig, all you're doing is extending the weight out in front of a floating worm. And especially if you use something that floats or whatever, uh, the length makes it move a little bit slower. But to answer that question, yes, on a Carolina rig you can fish it around aquatic vegetation. I like to just change my weights. Instead of using a one ounce weight, which is what I always throw a big Carolina rig on, then I'll go to more of a finesse Carolina rig and use a long extended weight, kind of like a mojo weight. That's like a little pencil weight that's hollow because it comes through the aquatic very, very well. And I'll just go light. Uh, you know, I love to fish a split shot an awful lot too, but you can go light on a Carolina rig and fish around aquatic, almost like what I was saying with Lonnie Stanley in that light jig and fish on top of the aquatic. Okay. Works very, very good. Very good. Good question. Uh, Bob Van Dam wants to know, here in Michigan on an inland, inland lake, I have caught both largemouth and smallmouth 30 to 35 feet. Is there a thermocline deeper than that in that lake? Yeah, there definitely could be. I mean, we're talking Michigan. Um, they don't they don't build a thermocline as quickly as we would uh, because your water temperature on the surface isn't going to get into the 80s till late in the year. Yeah, where we're going to have late. we're going to have 80 degree water by the end of May. Yeah. And so our thermocline builds a lot quicker. Uh, theirs will actually build build later. And then of course, like I said, in the winter they'll have a thermocline that's an insulation. Yeah, but also their thermocline in the northern waters is not going to last as long. That's right. It's going to happen, you know, pretty yeah, quick. That's right. Exactly. And your fish, um, whenever we're talking about Michigan, your fish, your water temperature starts out so much cooler so it holds more oxygen. Cold water holds more oxygen than warm water. So the fish on the bottom would actually still have oxygen that late in the year compared to what we have in, in the southern United States where we're going to lose our oxygen halfway through the year. Uh, good, great question. Uh, Eric Anderson wants to know, how does tidal water affect plant growth? Boy, I tell you, tidal water, uh, I like tidal water with aquatic vegetation mm -hmm. because I know what aquatic does to the bass population. But what tidal does, and folks, all tidal is, is a current change every, what, six hours. So you just get a shift in current. So you, all, you know, the flow just changes directions every six hours, but it's almost like a flushing. Mm -hmm. And it's never the same the same cycles. In other words, you know, if you get on a really good bite on that grass bed and you come back and it was on an outgoing tide and you come back on an incoming tide, a lot of times the fish may not bite. They're still there, they just don't bite because they're so conditioned to that flow. But aquatic vegetation in tidal mm -hmm. mostly is shallow. Usually it's always, you know, shallow. And the fish love to be around. And there's very limited species that can handle that. So usually it's, it's pretty hardy. Yeah, it's pretty hardy species and a lot of native species that can handle that. Especially if you have any brackish inflow. If you have any, any salinity coming in at all, that really limits the species down. Yeah. Uh, Dad, Joshua Smith wants to know what your favorite California lake is to fish. <laughs> <laughs> I have many in California and some that I don't really want to mention because they're real small. <laughs> Uh, California has always been dear to my heart because it does. It has some of the best fishing in the country. Um, uh, I would have to say the California Delta has always been a love of mine. Uh, of course, Clear Lake, I grew up on Clear Lake and the California Delta. I've always been intrigued by California now with the introduction of the Alabama spotted bass uh, that are trout fed and the size that they're growing. And yes, folks, I have been to Bullard's Bar. Uh, <laughs> and I have caught my personal best at Bullard's Bar. Uh, multiple times during the course of a day, but that's a real special place and places like that I do uh, Like to just offer a suggestion take care of them. They're very special very unique Because a place like that doesn't exist everywhere right. And California is real real fortunate to have that but a lot of your other reservoirs now are really producing your big spotted bass because they're trout fed so I would have to say probably my you know, it's really not a secret anymore, but clearly uh, Clear Lake's one of my favorites. 
Rusty Parker wants to know, when people spray and kill off the grass in a pond, how much stress does that put on the fish population? Yeah, Rusty, so that's, that's going to depend greatly on the time of year that that, that application is, is put in. So every single water body has what we call a biologic oxygen demand. So that's the amount of oxygen that it takes to keep all the fish, uh, the invertebrates, the plants, all those things alive every single day, plus the decomposition of whatever needs to be decomposed in that lake. So you have to have that biologic oxygen demand. Whenever you add a herbicide, all you're doing is you're putting in a, a larger load that has to be decomposed. Mm -hmm. So that takes oxygen to do that. Uh, so that increases your load on your biologic oxygen demand. So it really depends on the fishery, how much oxygen is there and what kind of plant density are we talking about. If we're talking pond management, there's simple rules. Just don't spray more than 30% of a lake in one application. Allow yourself three to four weeks before a second application. Don't knock it all out at one right. time. Don't do it all at once. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Um, but it, it's all about the oxygen production. We don't have fish kills using herbicide that aren't oxygen related. It's, mm -hmm. it's due to a lack of oxygen. That's, that's what the cause is. Uh, Tom wants to know, how do you make suspended fish react in stained water? Uh, most of the time, you know, there's two types of fish that we fish for as anglers. In clear water, we fish for fish that I call sight feeding fish. And in off colored water, we fish for fish that I call lateral line feeding fish. And what I mean by that, clean water fish can see a pretty good ways. So a lot of the techniques we use, I can pull the fish to the bait. When I'm fishing standard off colored water, I'm playing off their lateral line, their sense of feel. So I want to use a lure or a blade that creates more disturbance and even rattles that create sound. I'm going to play off their senses, plus stuff that they can smell, like the Berkeley Power Bait, they can really smell that scent. But suspended fish in, a, uh, I don't want to say muddy water, but in stained off colored water, I'm really going to pay attention to water displacement. Suspended fish, chances are I'm going to try to catch them on a crankbait. I'm probably not going to throw a, a swim bait because a swim bait to me is more of a sight feeding visual. Um, so I'm going to pay attention to water displacement. David wants to know what is your number one lure when fishing in the Northeast or in Pennsylvania? Uh, boy, I tell you, you know, fishing up north, um, <laughs> God, there's so many ways to catch these fish. Folks, I love to fish spinning rod, and you know, I'd have to be a fool if I didn't say a drop shot. Uh, a drop shot is probably one of the most, it's the closest thing to fishing live bait without using live bait. That technique, of course, Stephen, you've watched me fish it for years, how effective it is, but the things, folks, about a drop shot is if you don't really understand it and study it, then you're just fishing another rig. But let me just tell you folks, there's so much more to fishing a drop shot than just throwing it out there. And if you study it, you'll think, wow, it's unreal. But it catches largemouth, smallmouth, spotted bass. Uh, but I also know that in Pennsylvania, there's a lot of current. And a lot of uh, anglers in Pennsylvania love to fish for trout, or excuse me, smallmouth in the rivers. So they have a lot of jet boats in Pennsylvania and a lot of those waters the guys are fishing little crankbaits, little spinner baits. but what they're doing is they're reading the current. You have the eddies and the boils and how those smallmouth set up because they're hunting the whole time they're, but they're using current and the cool thing about fishing for bass in current is the current usually has those fish already positioned. So when I'm in the current I pretty much know the direction that fish is facing so now it's just lure presentation, no different than when I used to trout fish with a fly rod. It was always laying the lure out in a natural presentation, presenting it to the fish. When I'm fishing for bass around current, same thing if I'm flipping a jig in current. In 2003, I finished second the Bassmasters Classic out of New Orleans out of Bayou Sinet. Iconelli won that event. Could not have beat Iconelli, man. I fished 100% three days. Everybody I got, I put my hands on. But the cool thing about that particular, and the only reason why I'm bringing it up about that particular event, is all of the fish that I was catching were current related. But the key to my technique over other anglers is I figured it out in practice that the fish were triggered on a drift. Because again, I was fishing tidal. So I had current movement. And when that current started moving, if I was using a half ounce jig, it would just fall. And I would never get a bite. But I went to a light 3 8 ounce jig, and instead of flipping to the target, I would flip in front of the target and let it drift into the cover. 
that's how I was catching my fish there. So anyhow, just a little bit of information, but current helped me, you know, catch those fish positioning. Timothy wants to know, he says he's having issues um, on a lake in Ohio. It's blue-green algae and it's blooming at 43 degrees. He's trying to get rid of it, but can't figure out the best remedy before we have fish kills when the water hits 85. Do y'all have any information on that? Yeah, so blue-green algae, the cyanobacteria. I told Gary I did like a two-hour podcast last night, and this is one <laughs> of the topics we were covering with cyanobacteria. Um, cyanobacteria, we're seeing them more and more often. Maybe it's just we're more aware of them as fisheries biologists right now. Uh, but what they are, you know, it's, it, it is an algae. Um, it's growing because there's excess nutrient in the pond. So what I would tell him is, is first look at how much phosphorus is in that pond. Uh, and if there's a way, you know, do a water quality test, look at the phosphorus. And if there's a way to reduce the phosphorus uh, using either aeration to provide oxygen to the bottom. And once there's oxygen in the bottom, the soil will actually grab phosphorus and bind it to the soil. Oh, really? So it will pull it out of the water, or uh, he may huh. need to add uh, some sort of flocculant that's going to bind the, the phosphorus together and make it sink to the bottom. But we need to reduce the phosphorus load in that lake. Uh, by reducing the phosphorus, we cut the food source for that cyanobacteria. And cyanobacteria, is, uh, you guys had, had a dog that, that actually succumbed to that. Um, so those blue green algae can be can be very detrimental very toxic, yeah. and there, it's a sad thing whenever you know you've got a small pond and your dog goes and drinks the water and then all of a sudden you lose your dog mm -hmm. we see the same thing with livestock uh, even even people you know have digestive upset due to that so it's something we need to be aware of but it's all about phosphorus it's all about the nutrient in the water um, and reducing that over time Let's see I think we're about out of time but there's one more question uh, Paul wants to know what is the lightest type of line that you use a uh, six pound test line is the lightest that I use. And in all my light line fishing, and, and again, I have, I push it to the limits. And what I have found is this, there's very little difference between four and six, but there's a big difference between six and eight. Uh, so I fish six an awful lot. I fish six more than I do eight or 10. I actually, especially when I'm fishing clean water with a, a spinning outfit, and especially now that we've most of us anglers have learned how to tie an FG knot and do a braid splice to a fluorocarbon leader. It just makes it even a better tool. But I fish a uh, green six pound, 100% fluorocarbon, an awful lot. All right. Well, folks, we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you very much for stay tuned. And uh, we'll be back again Wednesday of next week, nine yeah, o'clock so central time. We need some topics. Uh, we need some topics. If you have any topics that you'd like for us to cover, uh, just you know, put them in here in, in the comments, and we'll go through and look at them, and we'll cover them. Thanks for having me. No, thanks for having me. <laughs> I, I learned just as much as you do. All right, we'll see you all next time. Thank you.